Hey guys, before we get started with today's show, I have some exciting news to share. Your Financial Pharmacist is now offering fee-only comprehensive financial planning services led by certified financial planner, Tim Baker. We're dedicated to serving pharmacists like you who want something better than the status quo. We offer our clients an honest, education-focused approach that is specifically catered toward handling the high-income, student-loan-laden, demanding career track of you, the pharmacist we serve. Our goal is simple, to get you from thinking, I don't know exactly what to do with my money, but I know I need to do something, to confidently saying, I know exactly what I need to do month in and month out to get out of debt, save for retirement, and achieve my financial goals. You can learn more by visiting yfpplanning.com. Again, that's yfpplanning.com. In fee only, you are not enhance or enrich by like any of the products that you're selling. So if I sell if I sell you a, a life insurance product, I don't get any commission for that. If I sell you a, a mutual fund or, or some type of investment, I don't get any additional commission for that. So you're paying for advice, not the sale of a product. You're listening to the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, a show all about inspiring you, the pharmacy professional, on your path towards achieving financial freedom. Hi, I'm Tim Albrecht, and on this week's episode, YFP co-founder and director of financial planning, Tim Baker, joins me to talk about his journey from entering West Point to becoming a financial planner. We talk about why all financial planning is not created equal, how and why we do our planning services at Your Financial Pharmacist, and why fee-only, fiduciary, and comprehensive matter. Tim Baker, excited to have you back on the mic. How's everything going? Things are going well. Yeah, looking to uh, looking to turn the page here on 2020 fairly soon. So um, good to be uh, meeting with with you and Tim and and uh, our our crew to figure out you know what YFP looks like in in 2021. Get a plan in place. Um, so been a tough year, but excited to to look forward, look ahead, and 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 what's to come for for our team here in the future. Man, I'm with you. It's been it's been a tough year. Uh, looks like the first half of the year may, may be uh, t- tough as well. But ho- hopeful that we're going to turn the corner here with uh, the pandemic. Obviously, we know many of our listeners' communities been been impacted by that, and uh, ho- hopefully, our community who's been on the front lines is going to get a little bit of a break here in some relief, um, and hopefully, get some time to to refresh. I know we've talked with many pharmacists that I think are probably feeling burned out given the pressures, the circumstances, trying to manage yeah. work, trying to manage home. But we're, we're thinking of you all often. Uh, appreciate what you guys do. And yeah, we're excited about 2021. Lots of exciting things planned for, for YFP. And, and here today, wanted to talk a little bit more, knowing that we, we have grown a lot in the last few years, uh, knowing that we obviously have, have many of our community members that are aware of what we do at YFP Planning, some, some that are not. And knowing that one of the things I find myself often talking about when I speak on the topic of personal finances, hey, when you're looking for a financial planner, it's really important. Not all financial planners and financial planning services are created equal. And it's important to understand what you're looking for, what's a good fit, what's not a good fit. And so we wanted to spend some time here today talking about why we do what we do, uh, what some of the terms mean around fee-only comprehensive financial planning, how we got to this point, and ultimately uh, what's included in, in the types of planning uh, that we do. So we're going to do that. But Tim, before we dig into that, uh, I think it was all the way back, maybe episode 15, somewhere around there, we had you on uh, to chronicle your career path, your journey into financial planning. But it's been a while. And I don't want to assume that the, the listener here in 2020 necessarily listened to episode 15. So take us back into your trajectory into financial planning, uh, all the way back to your, obviously your time at West Point, uh, what you did from there, and then and then how you got into the work that you're doing now and in, in offering fee only comprehensive financial planning to pharmacists. Oh man, I feel like it's been a while since I uh, I kind of told this story, so I'll try to I try to dust it off a bit. I feel like now it's more about <laughs> like the the team that we've assembled and, and everything. But yeah, yeah, I I took a very kind of a, a different route to um, becoming a financial planner. I, you know, I like to, to your point, Tim, I, um, out of, out of high school, you know, I, I was pretty uh, set on uh, the United States Military Academy at West Point and, and, and my, my trajectory um, for my career, I thought would be very much intertwined with service, military service. 
so I, I worked my tail off to get it, you know, and get into the academy and, you know, the, the world changed very, you know, very quickly when I, when I was there in my freshman year. Um, I think my first day at West Point was July 2nd, 2001. And obviously a couple months later, you know, 9-11 happened um, and really changed the, you know, the tone of, of what, you know, what our job was, um, you know, and why we were there. So, you know, I graduated, you know, four years later with a, a degree in international relations, you know, again, thinking that, you know, my, my, my career would follow more of a service tract and, mm-hmm. and commissioned as a second lieutenant in, in, um, as an armor uh, platoon leader. So tanks. Um, but I, I quickly found out that, you know, sometimes you have a plan and, and, you know, life happens, you get punched in the face and, and that plan goes out the window. So unfortunately I was, I was involved in a training accident that, um, kind of derailed my my military career, and and um, I, I medically was uh, separated from service, and I found myself a civilian, not really knowing what I wanted to do, and and um and, and really lost for a bit. So I I backpacked Europe for about four months, um you know saw twenty twenty some odd countries, and and came back and started a a career in material management, actually in Columbus, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, where where we recently moved back to. So my job was to basically move, you know, manage the department that moved boxes from A to B, you know, for a big uh, retailer here in uh, in Columbus. Um, so I did that for a span of years, and then and then moved out to Southern California to work for a construction company, kind of doing the same type of stuff of moving materials from A to B. And and I would say um, it was around this time that I kind of had a kind of a a quarter life crisis. Uh, I, I, I liked my job, but it, I, I felt like it didn't like me. I was working way too many hours for a six figure income, which was great. I didn't necessarily get a warm and fuzzy of what I was doing from a, from a day in and day out. And, you know, I had a relationship that kind of ended at that, at that time and I was just not living the best version of myself. So I took, I took some time off. I took, you know, probably about nine or ten months off to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, and I kind of came to this epiphany. You know, kind of from from some of the input from uh, two different family members that said, "Hey, you know, we think that you'd be actually really good as a financial planner." And I didn't really know anything about it. I, you know, I, finance had always interested me, but I decided to pursue that path, and I moved from Southern California back to the East Coast um, to, to work with a. A solo practitioner in Baltimore, Maryland, who was actually a Naval Academy grad, and basically started at the very bottom of the ra- of the of the ladder. Um, and I was more or less a glorified ass- assistant, um, and took you know probably a third of the pay of what I was making previously <laughs> um, mm-hmm. to really kind of introduce my or reinvent myself and really get into this this profession of, of financial of financial planning. Well, I, I'm grateful, uh, and I mean this gen- genuinely, as my own financial planner, but also knowing the impact you have had on the pharmacy community that you found this this career pathway. I mean, I, I think it's safe to say, and we'll talk more about the team and the services, uh, that this transition, quarter-life crisis, whatever you want to call it, uh, one of the results is, has been really putting a positive dent on helping pharmacists in uh, managing their, their personal finances. Obviously, debt is one one part of that. Um, debt management, student loans, but also the rest of the financial plan, like we talk about often on the show. And and I genuinely think the work that you did uh, and the work that you continue to do has had an incredible impact, not only on our community, but on on others as well. So you're working with a solo practitioner and you decide to make a jump to start your own firm. So why, why, why take on that risk? Why take on that journey? And what was enticing about going down that path? Yeah. So Again, not really knowing what I was getting into, and I think sometimes I talk to pharmacists and they say the same thing when they go to school. I think the big difference is the the debt that's often taken on, um, you know, with becoming a pharmacist, um, which is a good and a bad thing from a from a barrier to entry perspective. So I I, I completely you know just shift it and pivot it from what I was doing from a professional standpoint, and. You know, to kind of back up to that, when I was like trying to reinvent myself, I had my, my resume was written in a way that like I just kept going back to like material management. Um, so I, I really need to do something something bold, and it, it actually came down to network. And I know Tim, you talked about that to kind of get mm-hmm. into that 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 firm and really be super vulnerable to say like I don't know anything. Like 
when I got into material management, I used to say like I didn't, even, I barely knew what a forklift was. Um, when I got into financial services, like the only thing that I really knew about financial planning was, you know, you you would hire you know a person to help you, and I knew that credit card debt was bad, and you know investments were good, and you know buy a house that was a good investment, which is what my parents had said, but that that might not necessarily be true. But so mm-hmm. I get in, I I get into this world, and you know I'm 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 working with a solar practitioner, and it's very much kind of like. You know, you work with people who have hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you know you're working with them to help with them with insurance and their investments, and you know maybe give them a little bit of tax advice and things like that. And I quickly realized that me as a twenty something year old, or you know, uh, I didn't resonate. It, I wasn't really resonating with the people that I was working with. You know, I was working with you know, or I was supporting the guy who was working with a lot of like pre retirees and things like that. And then I, I quickly realized that there just so there's there's a lot of gaps. So right. you know after I after I started the process of getting my license in and 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 working on my CFP and getting that in place and getting every everything that I needed to do actually do the job, I started working with pharmacists fairly early on after that because I had friend most of my friends in in Baltimore were pharmacists. One of the guys that I went to West Point, one of, them, one of my, my best friends married a pharmacist. And they were very much champions of, of me and, um, and, and what I was trying to do. And I, I found with, with pharmacists and, and that type of client that you know, most financial planners will say, well, you have $150,000, $200,000 in debt. I can't help you. you, know, I, you know, come back to me when you, know, you, you have a couple hundred thousand dollars in, 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 in your investments and, and we'll go from there. Or they would say... We can help you. We'll invest your IRA. We'll sell you a crappy insurance product, and then we'll talk to you. You know, once every three or four years. And when I looked at the student loans in particular, I'm like, you know, and and you're not getting support and advice. Like that's that's not good. You know, most financial planners. I think it's gotten a lot better, but most financial planners, at least at that time, would say, uh, don't fi- don't worry about the loans. They'll figure themselves out and in, <laughs> invest or buy this product. And that's not good advice. You know, we we basically mm-hmm. we we say with pharmacist type debt, it's not a high hyper- it's not hyperbole to say it's a six figure decision on you know which way you went you, which way you go. And I think you and Church would attest that like if you would have went a different path for your loans, maybe like a forgiveness route, it would have been a different. You know a different uh, result. So I was starting to see this gap in the market, and you know a lot of a lot of it was like, "Hey, find your niche." And I kind of had stumbled into this niche already of working with pharmacists, and it just steamrolled from there. So I I, mm-hmm. I, I um, stumbled upon a group called XY Planning Network, who was a group of fee only um, CFP certified financial planners that really um, focused on Gen X and Gen Y, who are typically those. You know, individuals that maybe have a lot of debt, maybe decent incomes, but are not being serviced by you know the the, the financial planning you know sector. Mm-hmm. So that was really the 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 main drivers. Is I was I was thinking like, hey, like I think I can you know do this better, more efficiently, more targeted to who I was serving anyway, and and that's what I decided to do. So you started the firm Script Financial, and uh, yep. I, I actually have in my hand right now as we're recording my Script Financial pen, which is just an <laughs> awesome, awesome piece of history. So you start, you start Script Financial, and then you meet this other chump named Tim who knew this other chump named Tim that was also talking personal finance, uh, yeah. and the paths started to align, right? Yeah. So I think one of the other reasons that I decided to go out on my own, and it wasn't necessarily feasible in the model that I was in, is... I wasn't fee only in that first in that yeah. solar practitioner, and I think that's a good distinction to make. So, what I often tell prospective clients today when I when I talk to them, I'm like, for me, like whether you work with us or not, you know, that's obviously a decision you need to make. But to me, table stakes are are you a certified financial planner? So, unlike a farm D, a JD, an an, uh, an MD. You know, there th- those are professions where there's an education requirement, experience requirement, an ethics requirement. To become a financial planner, y- y- there's none of that. You 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 take what's called the Series 65. You know, you study for eight to to twelve weeks, and then you take a test. You know, and and you can do exactly what what I do or what we do today. So there's often a lot of um, salespeople that parade as financial advisors. Um, but that are really just hawking crappy products, to be honest. So 
sometimes people get upset with me. It's like, think about like, <laughs> um, like a real estate agent, like the, the barrier to be to entry to be, become a real estate agent is really low. Now to be a good, good real estate agent, you need to have experience and all those, you know, good ethics and things like that. Right. But the CFP designation is something that's really, really important. And then the other thing that's kind of table stakes is really if you're fee only. So this is really confusing and it actually confused me because I, I was probably about a year, a year and a half into my my career as a financial planner before I even knew what fee only was. And fee only is where you basically separate the sale of a product like insurance policy or an investment with advice. Mm -hmm. So anytime that you have an overlap between the sale of product and advice, there's a conflict of interest because I would say, hey, Tim, you're my client. Um, If you buy this insurance product, it's better for me in terms of commission, maybe not so great for you. And the same thing with the the investments. So in the fee-only world, you are we're, we're what's called product agnostic. So if I say, "Hey, buy this this life insurance policy," it's not because I'm enriching myself anymore. It's because that's that's what I believe is a tool to better protect yourself and your family. So I kind of use the medical analogy. It's it's why physicians are not supposed to get kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies Absolutely. because yep. it taints their ability to prescri- prescribe medications without strings. Yep. The difference in our profession, you know, air quote profession, is not only is it legal in our profession, it's prevalent. Um, so it's there's something like 95% of advisors out there can sell you a product that enriches themselves, i.e. I. Com- uh, commissions or kickbacks that a lot of the times the, the advisor doesn't know. Mm-hmm. So that was a main catalyst for me to, to, to move. I wanted to very, very much niche down. Most financial planners, they want to be everything to everyone. That's not, our, that's not our game. So we are very niche to the pharmacy profession and really um, wanted to provide services that kind of you know, ease those pains that they were having. And then the, the other thing is to put myself out as fee only or as a fiduciary, meaning that, I'm, that our, we, we are legally t- um, bound to act in the client's best interest, which, which for most people, you know, if you say, hey, your advisor can put their own interest ahead, uh, ahead of yours, they would be surprised by that. But that's actually the case. So yeah, um, one, once I made that leap, I started to, to network and you know, to get, you know, figure out how to get myself out there. And um, I came across your financial pharmacist on Twitter. And, you know, I always say like, who's this imposter Tim talking about personal finance and pharmacy? And I read your stuff and I really liked it. And it resonated, what you were saying resonated with a lot of the conversations that I was having with pharmacists at the time. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I reached out to you and, and we decided to meet Bob Evans in, in Ohio. And, and I think our first collaboration was the, was the podcast, which now has almost a hundred, uh, half a million downloads, I think is where we're at right now. So pretty exciting. So fun, fun story for our, uh, our listeners, uh, about the podcast. I was reflecting on this recently and then we'll get to the meat of what we're actually talking about here is we, we, at one point, Tim, I, I remember it vividly. I was on vacation with my family. We were down in Hilton head. We we're actually working on seven figure, <laughs> wrapping it up. And we're like, man, what should we call the podcast? Like, should it yeah. be, you know, like, I was thinking of like Mike and Mike on ESPN, which which are right. no longer a thing, right? Uh, <laughs> right? I was thinking about other names. And then, I, I mean, clear as day, you're like, maybe we should call it the Your Financial Pharmacist Podcast. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so sometimes it just hits you in the face and, and you know, you don't, you don't know it, but uh, it was good yes. times as we were, yes. we were getting that started. Yes. So we're going to come back. I want to come back and break down a little bit further in a moment. Fee only fiduciary comprehensive and compare some of the terms fee only versus fee based fiduciary suitability. Talk more about why, why that's important, but take us for a moment down the path of to so start script financial. We, we merge efforts at YFP. Obviously when we start the company, you're kind of doing all, not kind of, you are doing all of the planning. Uh, obviously now it's a, it's a team that we really uh, but believes in in what we're doing and and really embodies obviously what you have built and and the beliefs that we have around planning. So, what's your current role at YFP? What's the YFP planning team look like, and and what can folks expect from that team? Yeah, so my my role at YFP today is is a bit different than you know when when we started. Um, my role as director of financial planning is really more about kind of managing the. RIA or the registered investment arm, advisor arm of the business. So I manage the team that basically uh, brings financial plans to the pharmacists that we work with all over the country. And I think we're in like 38 states now. So it's mm-hmm. really managing that team and, and our process and making sure that we are delivering plans consistently and kind of 
with kind of in line with like our belief system. It's the business development. So like the prospect meetings, it's the IT stuff, the HR stuff, the compliance stuff. You know, we're, we're now, um, you know, overseen by the SEC, which is, which is good, but also, um, you know, compliance can be a, a bit of a tough, tough thing to crack. So yeah, my, my day to day is, is more, you know, managerial now in, in, in the, in the, the great team that we've assembled. Um, we, we now have two lead planners, um, Robert Lopez and Kelly Reddy Hefner, who, um, basically are, are in Arizona and Pennsylvania respectively. And, and these are the, the individuals that really quarterback, um, the financial plans for our clients. And, and they have the help of a, a support system. You know, Paul is our director of tax, Kim, Tom, and Heather are really, um, support, uh, to them. And, and really my, my, my vision with financial planning is that, um, it takes a village. Oftentimes, financial planners will have um, themselves and, and maybe another person in support. We kind of um, employ the diamond team model. That is the the, the group that supports the client the client's effort. Um, so that that's kind of the 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 makeup of our team. And, and I'm really excited about the team that we have. I look at across, and obviously, you know, we're pharmacy owned, which is which is very unique. But we have CFPs that um, are both. Married to um, healthcare professionals, um, Kelly's married to a, a physician, and, and Robert, I think his wife Shirley is a psychologist, um, and they've they've worked in their own firms, you know, dedicated to helping you know um, health healthcare professionals. You know, we have an MBA, we have a CFP in training, we have an IRS enrolled agent. Um, so I, I really like the team team that we have, and I think um, you know it, it's uh, imperative. That um, the team is in place to really support, you know, the effort, you know, the efforts of delivering the financial plans. And like I said, you know, this is, I think, I think Tim, you know, you, you struck a, t- a chord, you know, with uh, talking about your experience and and your initial blog post, you know, five years ago with your financial pharmacist, and we're seeing that year in and year out as um, you know more and more pharmacists raise their hand and um, you know really are excited about. Um, putting their financial plan in place and 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 improving, you know, kind of where they're at currently from a from a finance perspective. Absolutely, and a shout out to the team. They they have done incredible incredible work, and and I think have been so integral to our vision of helping as many pharmacists as we possibly can on, on their path towards achieving financial freedom. And as I mentioned, Tim, I want to come back to digging a little bit deeper to comprehensive fee only fiduciary. And I really like what what you said. Wh- whether somebody is ends up working with us or not i think it's really important that they understand what they should be looking for that will point them in the direction of the services that meet their needs and that have their best interests in mind and and i can attest to what you said earlier about it may catch many people off guard when they hear that about the variety of of these services but also the realization that most uh, legally don't have to act in the best interest of the client and may be charging for services in a way that may not align with their interests or needs. And I know for me as a pharmacist, when I first started that work and, and did some of the exploration into the types of services, that was certainly eye-opening for me coming from a training where it is drilled into us over and over and over again that your job as a pharmacist is you need to obviously take care of the patient, but you need to be acting in their best interest at all times. So when you say comprehensive, Tim, what, what does that look like? Pa- paint the picture of comprehensive financial planning. Yeah. So when you go to school to become a, uh, like a, a CFP, which I guess there's schools now, um, I feel like that, that wasn't right. there when even when I was doing it, but they have a curriculum that kind of follows really, I think like six main components. It's, it's kind of your fundamentals, what you think about like debt management and savings, insurance, investment, tax, retirement, estate planning. And a lot of people, you know, the last one there is estate planning. What is that? So, you know, just to break those down, you know, again, when we, when we talk to prospective clients, you know, the things that we talk about are, you know, for us, we go a little bit further. Like we look at like banking, like how you bank, you know, your cash flow and budget. And most financial planners are not going to provide kind of ongoing cash flow and budget support. They'll say, Hey, you're a good saver or you're not. And that's it. We provide it because it's it's a behavioral, and I think a lot of pharmacists were saying like, "Hey, I just want to be efficient with this this resource, this income that I have." Um, the big piece and the fundamentals are the student loan analysis, which a lot of financial planners, you know, there's a stat there that says seventy percent of financial planners don't 
advise on student loans. Obviously, with right. the, with with working with pharmacists, that's huge. And then really a savings plan. Like you know, most financial planners will say, "Hey, just put your that in your emergency fund." And I'm like, "Man, I, I just want more. There there needs to be more than just that." Um, so we take it a step further. You know, we really try to line up in a savings plan what we're actually trying to achieve with the, with the dollars that we're setting aside. But insurance is typically your, you know, your life, your disability, your your uh, professional liability. If you're a pharmacist, we do a lot more. I think with like um, employer provided benefits. So we do like a lot of open enrollment optimization meetings. So, hey Tim, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, it's open enrollment. It ends this month. Like, what do I do? And we just log on, and because that's a big part of your compensation package, investments. So we we manage the clients' investments both at their at their jobs, so like 401ks and 403bs. Most financial planners don't do that, so we can actually do that for you. And also held, you know, also at our, our own custodian, we do that at TD Ameritrade. So IRAs, Roth IRAs, you know, kind of the backdoor conversions, that type of thing. The big thing that I think that I think a lot of financial advisors will do is kind of like a nest egg calculation or are you on track or off track? I feel like most advisors will say, hey, you need you need this amount of money and then that's it. We we kind of like zero it in and like you're either on track or off. So we do the nested right. calculation and then we tile that back. Another big dif- differentiator for us is that we do taxes. Most financial planners don't. They'll say, hey, work with this accountant. And in my experience, that's what we said in my last firm, there was never really any cross planning between the accountant mm-hmm. that we were sending them to and their investments or anything that they had going on tax wise, which I think is a major misstep. And I think the other reason that we we do taxes now, Tim, is that most financial planners don't understand understand student loans and kind of the tax ramifications right. to student loans, and by proxy, n- neither do accountants. So I got tired of sending people, you know, elsewhere to do their taxes and then completely mess up, you know, the benefits of what we we're trying to do from a student loan perspective what, by not aligning the, the tax strategy. So to me, all keeping that all in house, and then finally the estate plan: do we have the proper wills, power of attorneys, and things like that? So that's where most planners begin and end. When we say comprehensive, we mean comprehensive. We go through credit, so credit score, credit report, especially if we're leading up to a big purchase like a home purchase. Because we work with so many, um, I mean, we work with people of all ages um, in you know 50s, 60s, 70s, even you know 20s and 30s. But because a lot of our you know, initially our, our clients were in their 30, you know, 20s and 30s, mm-hmm. a home purchase was a mi- big thing yeah. that they hadn't figured out. And when I bought my first home right before the housing market crash, I didn't know what a home inspection was or what an appraisal was, what I should be spending, mm-hmm. um, how to get financing, where to find a good agent. So we kind of do that from A to Z, you know, whether it's using um, our concierge service with Nate Hedrick, going through the home purchase worksheet of what they should be spending and, and what their must-haves and nice-to-haves are, helping with financing. It's just such, such a big thing that most financial planners are going to be working with people in their 50s and 60s that they've run that race already. So I I, I kept seeing like ma- like mistakes on the home purchase. And I think I've made them, Tim, you made them. And I'm like, yeah. there's got to be a better mousetrap here that we can build. And I think that we've done that. Sour negotiations, another thing. I kept, I kept hearing like, oh, I just accepted the job. And I'm like, well, did you negotiate it all? No, not really. I was happy to have the job. And I'm like, yeah, I'm with you. But I feel like, and we've had you know some clients on recently um, that 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 have experienced that and 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 how to negotiate and, thing, and things like that. So like, I think that that's another thing that's be able to advocate you know advocate for yourself. Um, real estate investments, another one. Most financial planners are not gonna they're not gonna encourage you to do that because a lot of financial planners are really incentivized by you investing traditionally, you know, in your IRA, four hundred one k, etc., and not something like like real estate but we we feel as a team that it, that is a viable way to build wealth has lots of good tax it's it's not correlated etc small businesses we work with a, a, a lot of pharmacy entrepreneurs and we're expanding mm-hmm. our services there education planning so hey you have kids how do, how do we how do we tackle that more people are are um, interested in the fire movement financially independent retire early so that's a completely different way to tackle the the financial plan. And I think the thing that we do differently too is most fan, most financial planners they'll say, "Hey, here's a 30 page document of what you need to do." We don't <laughs> do that, so it, we're very mm-hmm. much education focus of like, "Hey, this is this is the, kind of what you need to know, you know, enough to make it dangerous, but not enough to bore you to death." And and then recommendations, really looking through the lens of how can we help you grow and protect income, which is the lifeblood of the financial plan. Grow and protect net worth, which means increasing the assets efficiently and decreasing the liabilities efficiently. Most financial planners just care about, hey, I got you a great 
return on your investment, you know, in right. terms of the, the IRA, but they could care less about the $20,000 in credit card debt that you have or the $250,000 in student loans. And I think that's a big misstep. Um, so it's income, it's net worth while keeping your goals in mind. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I put them in um, ascending order of importance. So income is important, not as important as net worth, but not as important as your goals. And And what I typically say is, the clients is like we might work together for 10, 20, 30 years. And and at the beginning of our journey, we might say, Hey, Tim, you need five million dollars to retire. And that's typically where you look at me like I have five million heads because it's such a big number way in the future that we discount um, back to, to, to the present value. But let's pretend that we do work together for that for decades and you have $10 million. That's a great, that's a great accomplishment. It's a great thing. But if you're miserable because you haven't achieved or done the things that you wanted to do in life, what's the point? Amen. So to me, to me, the part about the hard part about financial planning, it's not the technical aspect, just like you need to be technical to be a, a pharmacist. It's, that's not really the hard part. The hard part is the human element. It's really threading the needle between what you know, your your present day self and yourself that's 30 years older, 40 years older in the future. And I feel like if you're not, if you don't feel that push and pull. We're probably doing something wrong, um, so that's that's it. You know, it's it's using all of these tools that are in front of us and 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 trying to work with the client in the most efficient manner that that is a that is that is delivering a plan that is you know the best version of what a wealthy life is to them, and 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 that's that's what we try to achieve every day. Yeah, and as, as you say, and I think articulate so well, it's not it's not just about the ones and the zeros in the bank account, right? We've yeah. got to be thinking about the goals. We've got to keep that front and center. It's got to be the framework in which we make decisions. And and I think a a fee-only fiduciary model allows a planner to invest the time and attention to putting goals front and center, even, even if that does not necessarily mean all the time that you're dumping more money in investments. It might mean paying down debt. It might mean philanthropic assets. It might mean real estate. It might mean insert any other, any other goal that might not have a direct tie to compensation in a fee-only model, but is the best for that client, for their goals, for the plan. And I think that's the beauty of comprehensive, right? Is, as you say all the time, is that when it comes to planning and YFP planning comprehensive, anything that has a dollar sign on it, you want the planner to be involved and engaged with the client because everything impacts one another when it comes to decisions that are being made. Yeah, it, it, it's it's true. And, and, and I think like, and I'll, I'll invoke a conversation that I recently had, um, mm-hmm. actually, before we started recording this, we had a client that that signed up with us early, early this year. And we, we were kind of doing a, a review and their net worth when they started with us was like negative 328, I think it was. And then, and this was in February is when we actually like, you know, did our, I think our get organized meeting today. So we're talking, you know, 10 months later, their, their net worth is negative 188,000 right around there. So that's a that's a net worth increase of about 140,000 in less than mm-hmm. a year. And again, I'll, I I will stipulate we were talking about compliance. You know, this isn't necessarily, you know, indicative of all all, all resu- you know, all client right. situations. But I I look at that and I'm like, man, that is great progress. Like that that that's really, you know, we we got the the debt buttoned up. Um the investments are humming, you know, they're doing a lot better job budgeting and savings. But there's for one, for one of the uh, people in the in the marriage, like the 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 work situation is almost to the point of being unbearable, hmm. and that to me is what's on fire. It's nothing yeah. really anything that's really tied into the financial plan. It's the anguish that you know she's feeling with kind of her day in and day out job. And I'm like, we have to we have to figure this out um, immediately uh, because it's just not sustainable. So like the ones and zeros, like impressive, but like. One of the things we talked about early in this year is to potentially look for, you know, a pathway out of her current position. We just haven't done enough, and obviously COVID happened. But to me, like they're they're wealthier than they were, you know, in in a lot of ways. But in a lot of ways, we're still stagnant. And I think it's it's kind of making sure that all of those important pieces and those goals are out that are out there are we're working towards and we're being, you know, the the word that we always say is we're being intentional to that. So. You know, to me, I think that's that's what it's really about, and it's going to be different for everybody, right? And and life changes, and yeah. you know, I have a lot of people that look at their goals, and then twelve months later, they laugh because they're <laughs> like they were in such a different different place. 
so to me, I mean, I think, I, I think part of this is like, you know, why we, why we are so, so comprehensive in a lot, in a lot of ways is maybe it's ego on my part. You know, I think the, the finances, the finances, you know, permeate everything. Um, Absolutely. and, mm-hmm. and I just, and, and for me, it's like, all right, you know, we, we, we were talking, we would talk about early on about sour negotiation. I'm like, I need to, I need to be a better resource to clients to, to help with that because, you know, that, that should be something that pharmacists, our clients are really putting themselves in a position to get the best deal that they can home purchase. I'm like, I really need to understand this from A to Z. So when they make this biggest purchase of their life, they're confident. Mm -hmm. And even like going into retirement to add, to talk about the other end of the spectrum is, you know, I don't think that financial advisors are really trained well to provide like a retirement paycheck and and really figure that out. It's all about accumulation of assets. But what happens when we then pivot into retirement and not just the ones and zeros and the mechanics of that, but also like, what does a wealthy retirement look like? That's not, it's, it, these are things that are, I think, you know, a funny, a good financial planner is, is coaching and talking about, um, to, to their clients, um, you know, on a continuous basis. So I, I think the comprehensive nature, you know, as I've talked with many individuals that that resonates a lot with people, right? Because they, they understand that they've got multiple things going on. And, and I think with, with some background information, they can understand that, you know, the traditional industry may focus more on investments or insurance, but right. as you go down the list of the other topics, you gave the stat about student loans, not, not so much. And certainly even any other, many others along the way of which you, you mentioned here during this recording. So I think, yes, I think many people will hear this say, yes, comprehensive, comprehensive, comprehensive. I get it. When it comes to fee only, this is an area where I see people confused or perhaps sometimes get in trouble where they may work with, meet with an advisor that may advertise being fee only, but really come to find out that they're fee based. They're not always in a fee only situation. So t- tell us the distinction of that briefly between fee only, fee based, and why it's so important. And I know you've already mentioned defined fee only, but the fee based specifically. Yeah. So, so when I was in my first firm and I was working with clients, you know, mo- most clients don't ask this, but, but when they do, typically for the, cl- for the planner or for the advisor, they kind of squirm in their seat a little bit because it's, it's in one, it's, it's not very transparent to the, to the client. So like if someone were to say, Hey Tim, before you started script financial, like how, how do you, how do, would you get paid? Or if a, a client would say, how would you get paid? I, I would say, you know, pull up, your, pull up a chair because it's going to take me a while for me to explain <laughs> this to you. So in the fee based model, what those advisors are, and again, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to demonize. They're they're good people, but again, like if I was a consumer, I would want to be in a position where I was treated as a fiduciary at all times, or you know, treat it, you know, by a fiduciary at all times. So, in the fee based model, the pri- the previous model, if if someone said, "Hey, how do you get compensated?" I would say, "Look, I could, I could charge you hourly, an hourly rate, like what an attorney does. I could, char- I could sell you a mutual fund that pays me." you know, X percent upfront plus a trail or a bigger upfront and no trail. So like an ongoing, you know, fee that basically takes away from the investment. I could charge you a percent of the assets that I'm managing, which is by and large what a lot of planners do. And even fee only planners, that's how they main, mainly do it. They'll say, hey, you have $500,000. It's 1%. It's five grand a year. I could charge you, you know, uh, to, to, to sell you a life insurance policy and typically the, the worst ones for for you or better for me in terms of what they pay out. Um, it could be an annuity. It, there's just so many different ways to do it. It could be a flat fee. There's so many different ways to do it. And it could be a combination of those two. So when I would work with like young, young pharmacists at first, I would be like, all right, well, I can, I can, I can charge you a flat fee for the financial plan. And then I'll charge you X percent of whatever I'm managing in terms of dollars, which is typically not a lot. And then I'll charge you a commission to sell you this life insurance policy and this disability policy. At the end of the day, it's just so confusing to the consumer because they don't even know what they're being charged. Yep. And that's why, you know, and that's why like like when I talk to a lot of uh, younger pharmacists and and you know, I'll I'll say like who's making the decision on who you're going to hire as a financial planner? And they're like, "Well, it's me, but I I'll talk to my parents about this." And I'll say like, "Ask your parents what they what they pay their financial planner. They're they're not going to know." You know, the first thing that my my parents said to me when I decided to, you know, after I was going through my quarter life crisis, and I'm like, I think I want to be a financial planner. They were mm-hmm. like, Well, why would you do that? Like, we have a financial planner, we don't pay them anything. And when we peeled back the onion, it was actually very, very significant of what they were paying. But it's not a an industry that's known for the it's for it being transparent. So in in fee only, you are not 
enhanced or enriched by like any of the products that you're selling. So if I sell if I sell you a, a life insurance product, I don't get any commission for that. If I sell you a, a mutual fund or, or some type of investment, I don't get any additional commission for that. So you're paying for advice, not the sale of a product. And I and I, when I was in the other model, Tim, I would you know we would we would get taken out to lunch by mutual fund wholesalers that would show up in their fancy suits. And mm-hmm. take us out to an expensive lunch and show us these glossies of why their funds were so good. And they would <laughs> say, "Hey, when your pharmacists bring money over, sell our funds." Wink, wink. So it's almost like a drug rep, almost. You know, no offense to drug reps out there, but it's almost like that type of that type of relationship. And you and you kind of feel beholden to them, like, "Oh, they took me out to a nice lunch." So it was just kind of like icky. It was kind of like gross. Yeah. So w- by separating, you know, the advice from like the tools or the products that you use. You're not in bed with anybody, so to speak. So you're really you're really clear to advise on the client's best interest. Now that's not to say that there aren't conflicts of interest. There are. You know, if you're in a an AUM model, an assets under management model, where you're charging a percent of the assets that you're managing, if a client has inherited fifty thousand dollars and they have fifty thousand dollars in debt, or they could put fifty thousand dollars into their investments. From that perspective, right. you're better off for them to, for, for you know, in terms of your compensation, for them to invest. So there are conflicts even even in the fee only world. So it's 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 important to understand what those are. But in fee only, it's much much less, and that's important. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the importance of fiduciary as well, and that they are obligated to act in, in your best interest. That that situation being a good one, and and kind of putting a bow bow around this as you talk to him, the words that stand out to me are as you're evaluating a planner is do they have the credentials. What's the scope of the service they're providing and how are they deriving their fees? So obviously we, we talked here, we believe firmly in the CFP, given yeah. its uh, r- yep. rigorous education requirements, given its hours of experience, the examination someone has to be able to pass, their competencies. So the credential is number one. Second would be the scope. We talked about the importance of comprehensive planning, making sure that they're addressing all parts of the financial plan and aren't incentivized to spend their time in, in one area more than the other. And then their fee, where are they deriving their fee? Where's that fee coming from? Is it transparent? Do you understand it? And is it being done in a way that has your best interest in mind? And that's, that's what I always tell people. One of the things I'm most proud of, of the service that we built, you really built at YFP Planning is that the fee is the fee, right? The service right. is a service. The fee is the fee. It's there. It's on the table. Uh, we've got nothing to hide. And, and we obviously stand behind the quality of what we do in that service. So Tim, for our listeners that are hearing this episode saying, you know what, I've been thinking about a planner for some time. I see the value. I heard about all of the things that are covered in, in that planning engagement, that planning relationship. And I'd love to learn a little bit more and figure out, are the services offered by YFP Planning, are they a good fit for the individual and what, what they're considering with their own financial plan? What what would be the best next step for them as, as they vet that decision further? Yeah, so you can go to yourfinancialpharmacists.com. There's a big green button, two big green buttons that say book a free financial planning call. So that would be either with myself or Tim Albrick. And we would see, again, if we would be a good fit. So that would be the, the best avenue. Um, like I said, a lot of people um, right now are thinking about, man, this has been a tough year. I really want to get my stuff together um, as we transition into into a new year. So it's a it's a busy time of year, but I think it's a, it's kind of the best time to you know take stock of where you're at and and really where you want to go and and have the the financial plan support that life plan that we talk about where it's not just mm-hmm. about the ones and zeros. So your financial your financial you know click the button book a free call and, and and we'd be happy to see if we're a good fit. Yeah, and we hope we'll have a chance to talk with with many of you here as we wrap up 2020, head into 2021. Uh, looking forward to setting those those goals, setting that plan for the new year. And as always, we appreciate you joining us on this week's episode of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. And if you haven't already done so, we would love to have you leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to the show each and every week, which will help other pharmacy professionals find the work that we're doing on the podcast. And we also would love to have you join us at the Your Financial Pharmacist Facebook group, a community of more than 7,000 pharmacy professionals all across the country that are committed to helping one another on their path towards achieving financial freedom. Thanks again for joining and have a great rest of your week.